All right, we're going to turn to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 12. And feel free to follow along in your Bible, otherwise it will be on the screen. Now it came about after this, that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Munites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Aram, and behold, therein has Hazan Tamar. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a period of fasting throughout Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, in front of the new courtyard. And he said, Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land from your people, Israel, and give it to the descendants of your friend Abraham forever. They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary in it in your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in distress, and you will hear and save us. Now behold, the sons of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not allow Israel to invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. For they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I did some recalculating again this past week. Emily and I have moved seven times in what will be 13 years of marriage this June. We did it twice one time, just for the fun of it, evidently, in eight months. So we know all about cardboard boxes and plastic tubs. We've gotten rid of more than maybe people, some people get in a lifetime. Now every move, if you've had the experience, I'm sure you probably have had some experience in this area, if you've had the experience of moves, each one has its own share of stresses. But I want to tell you about my most stressful move. And it wasn't the one to leave Michigan to go to Iowa, and it wasn't the one to move from Iowa here. We'd leave in states. It wasn't that. It was actually back in April of 2012. Now that month should be uh, fitting, knowing that I was a school teacher, we're still in the midst of a school year. We'd been in Iowa for about eight months. And I was sitting in my classroom one day during my prep hour, and all of a sudden I hear the scream or a yell of the word, what? Down the hallway. And it was a very familiar voice. It was the voice of a board member. The vo that very board member who had, those nine, eight or nine months before, had searched um, with great zeal to help us find a place to live. So she comes down the hallway to my office and tells, or to my classroom and tells me, or asks me how the move is going, or how the packing is going. To which I said, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, well, I got a call and they said they stuck a note to your door saying you have four weeks to move. They sold the property. And that was two weeks ago. So two weeks to move. We didn't have any idea where we were going to move. We had two, ho or, yeah, two horses at the time, or did we have the one, two at the time still, and we had, so we needed a pasture and a barn. Plus, we were both working full-time jobs. So I went into default mode. I got up, and I acted as quickly as I could. How many times would I move around and grab boxes, pack stuff? We'd just toss things into boxes. There was, this wasn't packing. It was get home and chuck whatever you could into the back of a box and drive it in the truck over to the house where we found to stay. 
a 30 minute drive each way to get to this house. So we packed our, our previous vehicle we had and we packed our truck full and we would drive back and forth. The only good thing I can say at the time was that we didn't have kids to boot with this. That would have made it even more stressful. So you know this is stressful. I've, I've also, by the way, I, I've uh, organized a move while Emily was pregnant. So that was, had its own stress as well. So this one tops that though. So weekends consisted of us taking more loads, along with rounding up some dads of kids that we taught to help us raise a barn. There was no time to breathe. No time for me really to think clearly. No time to pack in any organized way. It was a time that I can look back at and say, this was chaos. Now this was our fourth move. You would think that we would have had kind of our ducks somewhat in a row, even in the midst of the circumstance. Yes, it's had its own sets of chaos that were out of our control. But I, I can honestly tell you, not one time, not once, did I think about renting a U-Haul. And we just moved eight months before. That thought never crossed my mind. Now you're maybe wondering why you brought me here if I can't think about getting a U-Haul to move. But that was my mind was in, think, think, don't think about it, just get it done. You're in, and you have limited amounts of time to do it. It was a very stressful time. And when stress was high, I was almost unable to think completely rationally. And so as a result, it took much longer in the unpacking process as well, because things were all over the place. Now, let's contrast that for just a minute before we get into the message with our move here last June. Okay, this was about as stress-free of a move as far as we're concerned as there can be. See, we knew by the end of February that we were going to move. And within three weeks, schools were closed down. We were sitting on the couch. We even got to a point, believe it or not, that we were twiddling our thumbs trying to think, what do we pack? Because we had everything that we felt like we could pack, packed. We even got out Sharpies and labeled each box with what room it was going to go in. See, we took time, we were able to take time there to stop and to think and develop a plan to help us. So that as those of you that came and helped us unload boxes had a better sense of, okay, this box is going here or there. And it made the unpacking process, it wasn't fun, I'll tell you that, it's still not fun, but it made it a whole lot easier for us to be able to do. Now we can learn an important thing from a cardboard box or a container. Now if I pick up this box here, this, you know, it's pretty light, I can hold it here, I can maybe if I wanted to hold it for the rest of the service, and it wouldn't really even bother me. So it's not a big deal, I can pick it up and just, I'll, now I'll think about what I'm going to do with it. But when the box isn't so light, and you fill it up with seminary books and, and uh, Bibles and different things, it becomes important to stop and think about what you're going to do before you just act. And the same is true in life. When burdens and challenges are minimal, or we don't recognize them, it's pretty easy to just move about our lives as though, whatever, I don't have to give much thought to it, just whatever comes my way, comes my way, and I'll just handle it on the spur of the moment. But when life gets more difficult, when the real burdens of life start to hit, it's wise for us to stop, think, and then lift our burdens up in prayer. So let's consider this story now about Jehoshaphat. In verse 2, in what we read, we are told that a great multitude is coming against him from beyond the sea. And they had arrived and they were gathered in preparation for attack. 
You want stress, there's stress. They're not only are they coming, they're here and they're gathered and they're ready to go. We also learn in the text that it says it was a large enough force that he was described as being afraid. This was no small band of, of uh, people that they could just easily diminish and demolish. Most kings, leaders, would look at that situation and say, it is immediately time for us to act. In fact, it's past time to act, but to rally the troops immediately and prepare them for battle. Now, if they even stopped at all for wisdom, where they often would have looked was to these uh, individuals in their courts whom we might nowadays consider to be called, or we would call them yes men. In, in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, two chapters prior, we read that Jehoshaphat had made an unholy alliance with Ahab. And Ahab is prepared for battle at this point. He wants to charge right in. But Jehoshaphat says, hang on a second there. Let's, put the, let's slow down just a minute and let's consider the counsel of the Lord. Now Ahab, doing what most leaders would do, he gathers 400 of his prophets, his yes men in this case, and they told Ahab exactly what he wanted to hear. They said, yes, go do it. Go into battle. God is with you. But Jehoshaphat was wise. And notice what he said. In, this was in chapter 18. We didn't read this today, but it says, Is there no real prophet of the Lord yet still to consult? He understood that it is vital that we stop and think and lift prayers to God. My sermon in a sentence this week is this. To the world, action is the answer to life's problems. To the church, it's prayer. So if your life or when your life inevitably is interrupted, it's important first to stop and rest in the Lord's presence. Now in chapter 20, as I've already stated, Jehoshaphat found himself in the crosshairs. He had an enemy ready to eliminate them. Now let's be frank here for just a minute. It's real easy to look at someone else's life, to look at Jehoshaphat and say, of course, that's the logical thing. Of course you'd stop and think about it. You know, you'd sit there and look at me and say, of course, why would you not think about a U-Haul? And you're right, by the way, I should have. But it's much more difficult to discern and think calmly and rationally in our own lives. Even if the situation is closely related. But again, even when it's now in Jehoshaphat's midst, he is able to think wisely. Even though his own kingship is at risk. In verse 3, his response to this alarm that was brought to his attention was an interruption to his life. But he stopped again, and it turned his attention to the Lord. He proclaimed a period of fasting through all of Judah. All of Judah stopped eating. They fasted, but with a specific purpose in mind. We read on in our reading this morning to see that Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. Fasting is a great thing, but for a purpose. When we fast, we are to fast for a purpose. They came from all of the cities from Judah to seek the Lord. They dropped everything to come and pray. It's a big lesson in that. About being able to drop the things that are going on, the things that are causing us stress, causing us trouble, 
Maybe it's individual people who are causing us trouble and to be able to stop and pray for them or for the situation. Secondly, when life is interrupted, discernment is needed about what God is trying to teach you. Now, thoughts come through your mind every day, all the time. In fact, right now, there's probably a number of thoughts that are running rampant in your head. Some of them are positive thoughts. Some of them are negative. Some of them are beneficial. Some of them are detrimental. Maybe what you're thinking is, you know, I haven't heard from my child yet this morning, and it's Mother's Day. Or, I haven't heard from a friend in a while, or a sibling. And so maybe you think, something must not be right. Something's going on. I don't know what it is. But then you take a moment, and you step out in faith, and you talk to them openly and honestly. And maybe then you realize, you know what, this is what was going on. Something came up, and I didn't know that I made assumptions about the situation. Maybe you've drawn conclusions. I'm going to take the maybe out of it. We have all drawn conclusions about a person or about what others have said without having the courage always to follow up and ask why or what was going on. Or to have the courage to talk to them directly and to understand who or what is really going on. Now, in a digital age, you know, I've heard this many times in my adult life, you know, where information is thrown at us so fast, we can't even begin to process the tiniest bit of it. Even the information that we do latch onto, because each one of us latches onto certain pieces of information more than others, we would be wise to handle it with tremendous care. This is a vital, vital uh, thing for people that are living today, and it is we are not to be just simply consumers of information. Yeah, we need to consider the source. I'll tell you what. I never once, as a kid, I don't remember my parents ever talking to me really about, consider your source. Now, it doesn't mean that didn't matter, but it wasn't so blatantly out there. Now I hear people either teaching it within the schools or even in a home school or at home. It's, we actually have set aside time where we intentionally teach them about sources and about really checking and considering your sources. But the bigger problem here is how we came to that conclusion about some, whether something's true or not. It's a good question for you to, to sit on you know, over the next week or so. What is it? What is it that really determines whether something becomes categorized in the truth part of you or the false part of you? Something is not, sim not true simply because either Fox News or CNN said it. Something is not true just because it was stated. I can guarantee that a, there's a good number of the thoughts that run through my mind are not necessarily the truth. Just because you think it doesn't make it true. We are, as Christians, to be people of what I call the pause. This is discernment. You don't discern something like someone says it and there it's discerned. Discernment requires pause. It's for us to be able to rest easy in silence and stillness. Time to pray. Time to dig into scripture. Clearly thinking about what it is that was said. Because clear thinking and discernment are components of the transformed mind. Now the modus operandi of today is to just accept or receive information without really much discernment. Oh, this sounds good to me. It kind of fits what I think is true. Therefore, it is. Or, you can't fool me with that. That's very clearly not what I have already categorized as truth. Therefore, I'm going to remove it. Or on the flip side, someone asks you a question about whatever, and it's, here's my answer, with very little discernment about, is that truth that we are spreading? And it's only gotten harder 
in the world we live in today. Because now, where do we believe, where do people believe, let me say we as in, where does the world think we find truth? The world will tell you time and time again in 2021, truth is in you. You make the decision as to what truth is. You're the dictator of right and wrong. But that's the same lie that was given to Adam and Eve at the beginning. So because of this, we need to recognize this. If you are not aware of this, that we live in a very relativistic society. We are diminishing the value of absolute truth. And what I mean by that is, we leave it to say, well, this is what I believe, this is what you believe. We can be in complete opposition of one another, and somehow we're supposed to accept that they're both correct. So it shouldn't surprise us in lieu of the world that we live in, that people tend to operate by whatever soothes their ego and their preferences. I hear this in the church even at times called cafeteria Christianity. Have anybody heard that term before? So that's basically the... Okay, here, on one hand, and not to say that there's not some overlap, but on one hand, here are my biblical truths. These are the things that I profess to believe in. And here's my options. The Bible's one of my options. Well, okay, I'm going to take a chunk of the Bible that, yeah, this, this really soothes, this really sits easy with me. Yeah, I can, I can accept that Jesus loves me and that he died for me, But, you know, you know, maybe it's, this, this hell thing just doesn't really sit well with me. You know, how could this loving God allow for there to be a hell? So, eh, I'm just going to leave. You know, let, let's just, let me just, I'm going to just speak in a way that says, no, I believe in karma. Okay, again, this is all play. Please understand that. But this is how we operate. We say, this is what I believe. And then we step over here into real life, if you will. We, we, step, we, we step back into our everyday interactions with people, and what we say and what we do tells us that what we said over here isn't really what we believe. There's another area that we are called to be set apart. I've said multiple Sundays about the, the word holy again this year. We are to be set apart for God. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Mark chapter 7, verse 15 says, It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. So what we think, what we say, what we do, is really an expression of our hearts. But we need to live by the mindset that David had in Psalm 119, verse 11. He said, I have hidden your word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. David here is informing us that God's word is so implanted in his heart, it can't be removed or, or uh, found even. It's become his identity. The world doesn't understand this source of identity. Where our source of identity even comes from. And that's why we're playing identity politics. They're trying to find our identity in the things of this world. But our identity is in Christ alone. But they just don't get it. We need to submit our whole lives to our king. Because as we read in Scripture, he's going to burn up what is of no value. But he's going to be glorified by what we bring before him that is found to be worthy of praise. Point three. 
Last point here. When our lives are interrupted, make prayer a priority. Notice that right away, after pausing and thinking and talking to his trusted individuals, he says that he resolved, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. He understood the necessity and the power of prayer. One of my favorite quotes of all time, non-biblical quotes of all time from Oswald Chambers, who was a theologian, is this. Prayer is not the preparation for work. It is the work. Prayer is not preparation for the battle. It is the battle. See, one of the psychological ex experiences that we have, the effects of stress, I learned a lot about this when we were in the classroom, is that our brains cannot function at normal capacity. When stress is extremely high in your life, it essentially shuts down physiologically the part of your brain that allows you to function in the problem-solving area. It's unbelievable some of the decisions people make when stress is high. Stress causes us to go in what, again, this is academia for you, go into what we would call fight, fight or flight. Now, I think I heard there's maybe a third one added on to that now, but I think of fight or flight. Now, when we are in fight or flight mode, it seems as though life just speeds up, just as it did for us with our move. Life was feeling like it was flying a thousand miles an hour, and I couldn't make it stop. I didn't know how to make it stop because I was just swept away. We feel like decisions have to be made immediately because we don't have time. In churches, this often rears itself when we get into the, the topics of changes being discussed. I've witnessed many church splits where people fight tooth and nail for their preference. Or they just get up and leave and go to another church, thinking they'll find what they're looking for there. But there is no perfect church this side of eternity. The best way for us as a church to continue to increase our relational health is to do our part in cultivating healthy relationships. So is there something between you and someone in the church that's maybe here or not here today? Or is there something between you and a, bro a, a biological brother and sister? Is there something between you from 20 years ago? And that person is still around, and maybe you see them and you think, I'm just going to kind of go the other way. But I'm going to go back to the first part. If there's some, something between you and anybody, whether it be current or past, and it hasn't been addressed, we need to address it. Do it today. Work it out. Resolve it today. Resolve not to stay in, I'm just going to separate myself from this individual, or I'm just going to run away and go somewhere else because I don't have the resiliency or the willingness to trust the Word. And this is what I'm talking about. The Word says, when there's an issue, resolve it with a brother or sister. And over and over and over and over again, we just kind of bypass that. Because it's difficult. And if it can't be worked out one-to-one, -one, the Bible says, bring a mature Christian or a brother or sister to help work it out. Now, when anxiety is high, in addition, we are not able to discern well. I mean, if you can't even problem solve, it becomes very difficult to think you can discern. As I've said, there's research that shows that a significant part of your biological brain is actually closed off when anxiety is high. So, isn't it a beautiful reminder? When we know that, to flip open to 1 Peter 
chapter 5, verse 7. And this is what he says. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, when, 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 when stress happens, we, we, we take it all upon ourselves. We close ourselves in. We ask for help even less because it's our problem. We've got to deal with it. And God says, no, stop. Think and cast your prayers or your anxieties in this case on me. When life is chaotic and hectic, it's as though you're being pulled upstream. Or so you're pulled downstream, excuse me, and you've got to try to swim upstream. And that swimming can only begin with prayer. Jehoshaphat's prayer here in this end of, of chapter 20 echoes what Solomon prayed in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. He said, When famine or plague comes, comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when enemies besiege them in my cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a prayer or a plea is made by anyone among your people Israel, being aware of their afflictions and pain, and spreading out their hands towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their hearts. This is our time to pray. Begin with confession of your own sin and repentance for it. We all have sin in our lives. No one in our society or in our nation or in our world is without sin. Isaiah confessed as a prophet, I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. Just because an action or an attitude or a custom reflects the majority opinion. And we're seeing more and more of this in our country. Just because popularity of some attitude or action is more prevalent doesn't mean that it aligns with who God is or his will. Confessions and repentance must begin in our community. So another pertinent question for you to jot down or think through is this. Where might your actions, your attitudes, or your opinions stand in contrast with God's way? You know, we often think, well, I'm following the Bible. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm doing this is, my way has got to be God's way. Well, no, not always. We've got to recognize out of humility that there are situations and times and places where we, we are uh, walking in opposition. It may not be defiant opposition, but maybe it is. Where have your priorities in your life crowded out God's priorities? I think about that every day. Where have I put things, how, where have I built things into my life that may even seem to be good things. But I've traded those things for something that God really, really wants to be a part of my life. Do I spend enough time in prayer, or do I say, you know what, I'm going to just focus on these other tasks that do need to get done? Yeah, they need to get done, but is that getting in the way of something that is the work? We need to pray for a renewal of faith and commitment to Jesus Christ in our own lives, in our nation, in our communities, in our, in our whole world. We need to pray for God to intervene in all of the stuff that we are seeing, in the sicknesses, the diseases, in the, uh, the things that are happening, even what we would call environmentally in our world, the tornadoes, the hurricanes, all of these things, these things that we knew were going to kind of ramp up as we end, as we get to the end of our days. We need to pray for our state, local, and national leaders that they find God's priorities and wisdom. We need to, I need you to continue to pray for me and for other pastors to continue to provide support and guidance and truth and wisdom 
That their priorities, that my priorities are focused on his kingdom. Not about what you may or may not want to hear. We need to pray for generous hearts as we go about caring for those around us. For sensitivity to those who are in the midst of trials. And the only way we can really do that is by, make, by making sure that we are continuing to work on our relational connectedness here as a body. Ask the tough questions. Ask the, be willing to go beyond the surface. A great place to start is, how can I pray for you this week? Open the door and then do it. Or, or would you let me pray with you right now? Even better. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we know that you have given us this incredible gift, this connectedness to you through prayer. Lord, and through your word. Sometimes we don't realize just how blessed we are to have access to your written word at the tip of our fingers every moment of the day. Lord, we are not reliant upon oral traditions solely for what we have access to. And yet we all too often allow our Bibles to collect dust. Lord, we have access every moment of the day through prayer. We ask for forgiveness when we have been found to be busy, too busy to, to stay in community connection with you. Lord, teach us in those moments of life to have Less the mindset of just get up, go, and do whatever comes across our mind, but instead have a mindset and a lifestyle of praying without ceasing. Lord, teach us to turn to you first with anything that's going on in our lives, immediately to lift up praise for the things that we've seen that are praiseworthy. Lord, we pray also that the, that the first thing that comes to our mind when, when we're going through trials is, Lord, we trust you. We know that what you have in store for us is what's best. So we're going to buckle up and we're going to do what we can to best enjoy the ride. Teach us what you want us to learn as we go through this. Father, I thank you finally for the, the godly wisdom that we, that we see in the scriptures from a variety of sources. Lord, we know ultimately the commonality between each of these individuals in their phases of life with you. That they were trusting you, they were seeking after your heart, that they were longing for your will to be done. Help us today to take those truths with us that as we go out to act this week, as we go out to discuss maybe to debate, maybe to have conversations in the public square, that we are reminded that our source of truth is you, it's your word. Lord, help us to speak slowly, to think discernfully, to stop and to pray to you. Give us the wisdom to speak truth in love everywhere we go. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. And then there will be one closing song again. Mothers, don't forget on your way out to pick up a flower. <coughs> Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in work, knowing of the work of the Lord, knowing that your Lord, that in your Lord the, your labor is not in vain. Go in peace. Amen. And remember. Time to serve. I forgot my statement there. <laughs> You've been called.